Ooh, so this totally depends on the kind of... <laughs> <laughs> Apparently DW is going to post his. <laughs> <laughs> well, you'll have to edit that out. Um, <laughs> or not. That's not bad. Uh, D- the, the DW, DW not has bad. some training advice. I'm announcing his intentions here. Um, <laughs> sorry. Uh, anyway... Welcome to the Canadian Cycling Magazine podcast. I'm Matthew Piaro, editor of the magazine and your host. You just heard Molly Herford and her dog DW interjecting as we were trying to discuss training intentions. Usually, the first thing you hear on the show is a teaser for part of the discussion later on. But not this time. No, I'm leading with DW's input. But that's all you'll hear from the pooch. There will be more laughs, though especially when Molly puts my poor little ego in check. Mm, in a good way. Molly is a contributor to the magazine and the podcast, although it's been a while since she's been on. Now is the right time to chat. She has a great story in the magazine about why you should ditch training goals or resolutions for 2021. That's not to say you shouldn't stop riding or stop trying to improve on or off the bike. Molly is simply proposing a different approach to training in what she calls these hashtag uncertain times. Molly and her partner Peter Glassford host their own podcast, Consummate Athlete, and have a new book called Becoming a Consummate Athlete. Some of our discussion picked up on ideas from that book. Some other things that came up are cross-country rider Haley Smith's 2018 bronze medal ride at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games, bathtub crayons, Marie Kondo and cycling gear, and the book Forever Fit by pop legend Cher. But most important, there's lots of great training advice for the year ahead. Molly Herford, what's wrong with setting training or fitness goals for 2021? Why does it feel like we're scrapping New Year's resolutions this coming January? This is a really, really hard year to have a bunch of resolutions around, you know, I want to podium at XYZ race or I want to travel to these far flung places. Uh, You know, anyone who set goals or resolutions in 2020 knows that uh, by June, we'd pretty much had to X off all of them from our, our lists. So it's it's pretty understandable that we're all a little bit uh, nervous about the idea of setting any any kinds of resolutions for 2021. Uh, just because we we just don't know what the world is going to look like. So I think, if anything, this is the year to be gentler with ourselves, but still not let ourselves get away with, you know, not making any kind of, uh, you know, goals or resolutions for the new year. Just Just looking at them in a different way. So we're not throwing in the towel. We're not just hanging up the bikes. We are... We're just re-examining or taking a new approach to how we ap- approach fitness and getting better on the bike or in, in endurance in general for the next year. Is that correct? Exactly. Yeah. So instead of kind of setting these very specific numbers-based or event-based goals, it's really thinking more about how you want to feel this year, which I mean, honestly, is kind of a great way to think about your goals or resolutions anytime, but right now more than ever, how you feel is going to be so much more pertinent and so much more, honestly, actionable than setting a really specific resolution around a goal event. I want to get more into that idea of how you feel. And I think you use the word intentions. I might be uh, drawing that from your article, which is uh, the basis of this talk. But before we get into feelings, intentions, let's look back at goals and the mechanics of a goal or the features of a goal and how we're either going to scrap them or or save some of them. So what are the features of a traditional non-pandemic training or fitness or race goal? Yeah, I mean, for years, we've been told that we should be setting SMART goals. So that's an acronym, S-M-A-R-T, which is Specific, Measurable, Achievable, Relevant, and Time-Bound. So now if we if we think about that with the pandemic in mind, 
specific might be out the window. We can't really set the you know objective of, say, doing the Leadville 100 this season because we don't really know for sure that it's going to happen. Uh, measurable, you know, same kind of situation might be sort of iffy if we aren't going to necessarily get to do our goal event that we had a certain time in mind for achievable if the event doesn't happen it's pretty tough to do uh (laughs) relevant again we don't know if we're going to be able to do these things and time bound the way everything keeps getting pushed back or canceled you know it's just hard to set any of these goals that we might have set in past years so we're we're sort of going to throw out smart goals for this year it's just sort of too depressing and i think you know more importantly it's okay so we set say 10 smart goals for 2021 they're so easy to cross off as soon as one of those things gets you know canceled so okay leadville is canceled okay we're just going to throw that goal out okay you know this gravel grinder is canceled we're just going to throw that goal out instead of just trying to kind of shift gears a little bit and say okay what could i do instead we're sort of giving ourselves almost license to just completely x off the goals because they're not going to happen if that makes sense it does and so since these goals don't really work for us at the moment Tell me more about the solution you explored in your recent article, uh, which is intentions or feelings and how they might guide your year ahead. Yeah. So the idea of intentions maybe it sounds a little bit woo woo, a little bit loose, a little bit more casual. And that's because honestly, it, it sort of is. Uh, we're really thinking about how we want to feel. So, you know, instead of saying we want a podium at you know, whatever gravel race this year, you know, maybe it's just I want to actually enjoy being out on my gravel bike this year. So really pausing and reflecting and thinking, what is it about our past goals that got us excited? Is it riding with friends? Is it achieving a certain, you know, intensity on the bike? Is it just being outside and getting on the bike and doing your training in order to be ready for the event? So you actually went out and rode four times a week. Is it actually just those moments when you're on the bike and everything actually is just working really well and you're just ah, really enjoying the ride? So really thinking about how you want to feel in 2021 instead of thinking about what you want to accomplish, which is a really weird thing to be thinking about when you're heading into New Year's. And it's all, you know, as you know, I love to write about the New Year, New You concept. Uh, This year, we have to just be a little bit gentler and think about uh, New Year, same me, but, you know, maybe more of the good feelings. You are one of my go-to writers for, for that topic. You always approach it in, in new ways uh-huh, for the New Year's. But um, I have to admit, when you first presented me with this story for the magazine and the idea of working with intentions, I'll be honest, I was suspicious of these things. You know the old saying, right? The road to hell is paved with good intentions. So I worried that for training, intentions might be too vague. I could say something like, I want to lose weight or I want to ride more. And then the problem with those statements and what's smart, the smart sort of idea of goal setting it was as I understand it meant to address was to keep them from being too vague or, or too easy to dodge or fudge or forget. So if an intention doesn't demand, say, the same old rigor of goal setting and planning, how do you make a good (laughs) intention? And by that, I mean a useful good intention, not, you know, the hell paving kind of good intention. Well, so I think the first thing to remember is that I think it's something like 90 something percent of people have already failed in their New Year's resolutions by February. So... Uh, I mean, it's not like we're starting from, oh, yes, every New Year's resolution gets met. Every smart goal that's set, people do it. And especially during a hashtag these uncertain times, it's become harder and harder than ever to actually make those happen. So I think it's it's a tough thing because, yes, I mean, you're totally right. You can set these intentions and then completely forget about them. But I could say you would do the exact same thing with a smart goal. I think the intentions actually give you maybe a little more leeway to go away from them and then come back to them. The nice thing about intentions is it's hard to get them wrong, right? So if you say, I want to lose weight or I want to eat healthier, just because you had one week where you maybe overindulged a little bit on the cake and the pizza, say, you know, on New Year's week, uh, which we're all kind of inclined to do, you know, you can still come back to your intention versus a SMART goal where I feel like sometimes the second it becomes, 
you know, oh, I gained weight back or, oh, like this, you know, this race isn't happening or, oh, I'm just not going to get to my number of rides I wanted to do this month. We just cross it off and we completely get rid of it. The intention can kind of sit in the back of your brain all year and you can just kind of keep coming back to it, turning the dial back to it. And it's just going to be buzzing in the back of your, your mind, unlike a smart goal, which can be just a little bit almost too intimidating to really take action on once you've kind of gone away from it. So, and I will say, you know what, for some people, the SMART goal might actually still be the best be the best way to go about goal setting. I'm not saying that everyone should skip the SMART goals or only set intentions, just that for the people who struggled in 2020 with their their past goals or have never been able to keep a New Year's resolution, maybe the intention is the the new way of looking at it that they actually need. I have one example to help me and listeners maybe better understand intentions. In 2018, I spoke with cross-country rider Haley Smith. You've spoken to Haley on on your podcast, too. Love her. (laughs) I spoke with her after she took bronze at the Gold Coast Commonwealth Games in Australia. She said that before the race, she wasn't focused on a result. She was only focused on the effort. She wanted to drive every climb. Those are her words. And in the interview, she called that a goal, that driving every climb. But does that approach maybe seem more like an intention to you or a goal? I think that's actually a fabulous intention. It's kind of back to that, like just trying your best on every single ride or in that specific case, like trying your best on every single hill you're you're going into it full gas. And that's the kind of approach that you could take for your rides at home too. Instead of thinking really strict sets of intervals or something, you could consider your intention for the ride is to hit every hill full gas or, you know, when you hit a flat, go full gas for as long as you can, that kind of thing. So just kind of a little more open-ended approach. And I mean, as Haley has proven, obviously that, that can work really well for some people. And I mean, actually, to that point, Catherine Pendrell has said she actually often won't train like looking at power, won't have power numbers in her head for what she wants to achieve in intervals, because she actually found that having a specific wattage she wanted to aim for ended up kind of like making her power lower because she would just aim for that. She wouldn't see if she could go beyond it. That's interesting because especially for both those riders, they, they seem to have gained success from their approaches. And it, in a way, runs counter to a lot of what we talk about either on the magazine or on Canadian Cycling Magazine's website. We're very much in a moment of numbers and like, come on, Zwift, your FTP, your (laughs) watts per kilogram. Like, we're so inundated with numbers that that's an interesting, um, I don't know, approach to just forget them for a second. For sure. And I will say, you have to remember, athletes like that have had the numbers for so long and have spent so many hours training and knowing their numbers that, you know, it's important to remember that what works for them is not necessarily the same thing that works for a beginner. It's a lot easier to say, oh, yes, I know I don't need to look at the numbers when I'm doing this interval because I know I can go harder or push harder uh, when you're, you know, an Olympic champion uh, versus someone who, you know, is really just getting into training with power numbers. So. Anytime we take advice from the highest of the high level athletes, we have to remember that they have a lot more knowledge about this stuff than we do. Should you tell people about your intentions on January 1st? Should you post them on social media? And are there benefits or pitfalls to, say, posting or not posting? There are some pluses, but also pitfalls to posting your intentions. Uh, For some people, posting their intentions, unfortunately, can be problematic because you actually get almost the same flood of hormones of achieving a goal. So if I post it, I'm going to almost feel like I've already achieved that intention or that goal. You're almost kind of getting the benefit without actually having to do the work. Uh, For some people, though, they need that accountability of putting it out there. It's going to totally depend on on what feels good to you. I think the important thing, no matter what, is that you write them down somewhere. We don't just kind of keep them in the back of our brain 
and have thought of them on January 1st. We want to have these written down. I'm a huge fan of um, embarrassingly like uh, bathtub crayons that little kids have to draw in the tub. I actually use them and write stuff in the shower, like write myself little intentions and objectives and goals. So that way, every time I shower, I see them. Uh, People write in lipstick on the mirror in the bathroom, that kind of thing. Uh, I think those are actually hugely helpful, just as long as it's it's posted somewhere, whether it's for everyone to see or for just you and the people who use your shower to see. (laughs) Well, I I think that is a good point. Like you need to make it real or concrete or meaningful in some way. But um, I imagine for some people to to post on social media, it might be you may get that a rush of a faux accomplishment. But then I don't know. Uh, maybe this is just me speaking, but I don't want someone to go, "Hey, it's February seventh, uh, Matt. How was uh, how's that coming along?" It's like, oh, I didn't do it. You know what I mean? I don't want I don't want that conversation to happen. Okay, first of all, who is doing that just based on a Facebook post that you put up on January 1st? That's also a very good point. This is a fictitious problem. Yeah, I'm going to make the <laughs> argument that this is a fake problem that people have because no one, no one is like hunting you down to check on your resolution. Like the only way that accountability works is if you've picked an accountability partner that you you've agreed is going to check in with you. Otherwise, like, let's be honest, nobody cares about your intentions or resolutions or anything. Tough love. Oh my gosh, that is the best reality check I've I've gotten in a long time. Dear Matthew, no one goes back to your posts to check what you said. Really sorry, Matt. <laughs> no, that's 100% true. So there you go, people. Go ahead and post on January 1st. Yeah, no one's going to remember by February. They have their own problems. They have their own intentions. They have their own resolutions that they're also forgetting. <laughs> All right, good. Well, that helps me, actually. That helps me a lot. Um, That question about uh, should you tell people, it came to me after looking through your most recent book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete. It's by you and your partner, Peter Glassford, who's also a contributor at Canadian Cycling Magazine. I want to talk about another element to fitness and training that both you and Peter have written about uh, in the magazine, in in your book, and on your website, and that is habits. What role do habits play in all of this? I'm going to say they play just every role in all of this. I mean, whether you're talking about the habit of consistently doing your training or, you know, the habit of getting up and moving a little bit in the morning or hydration, pretty much everything that you do, whether healthy or unhealthy, can be broken down into habits. And I think the ones that we really are excited about are the ones that aren't necessarily during your training, but during every other hour of every day of your life. Because, you know, when you're a busy athlete, or you're, you know, a busy person who also happens to be an athlete, it can be super hard to add more training hours. So, you know, we've kind of maxed out our efficiency with training, but what can we do, you know, during the rest of our lives, you know, sitting at our desk from nine to five uh, that can actually help make our training more efficient and more effective. And that's where we get really excited. How do you add habits and goals? And when do you say no to some of them? Where this comes from is I know it can be tempting when you're brainstorming and you're planning and you're like, yes, I'm going to boost my FTP to 220 watts and I'll learn to bunny hop and I'll make sourdough and I'll shed two kilograms. But as you're as you're brainstorming and goal setting, like how do you keep the intentions and the pursuit of new habits realistic? Because you kind of already said we've maxed out our time uh, with what we can do, let's say on the bike or in the gym or outside. So yeah, where do you say no? Where do you draw the line? Ooh, so this is actually a really good one. I was just writing about this and it's in the book, but I really like the idea of thinking about whether a habit is going to be an addition or subtraction based one and just thinking about the times for one. So as far as say you're like losing weight one, you know, we could think about, okay, to lose weight, we either traditionally speaking, we're talking you need to exercise more or eat less or arguably eat better. So, okay, we don't have more time to train, so we're going to nix exercising more from that equation. But how can we eat better? Could we add more vegetables to our diet? And okay, that's addition, but it's not going to take us more time to throw some spinach in with eggs or throw some spinach into a smoothie in the morning. Uh, In a lot of ways, you know, that's actually going to save us some time. Uh, You know, can we subtract maybe one of the glasses of wine that we're having or, you know, some of the chocolate that we're eating in the in the evening? 
So thinking about where we can take things away instead of necessarily having to add things. I think that's kind of my always, that's that's where I start when I'm thinking about how to save time when I have a massive list of goals. Uh, and then, I mean, even thinking about that list that you just mentioned there, a lot of those goals are going to kind of go hand in hand, right? Like if we're going to increase our FTP, we're going to be doing probably some more targeted intervals, you know, working a little bit harder in the time that we have on the bike, which is probably going to help contribute to that more exercise, which is probably going to contribute to the losing two kilograms. So we can sort of have all of these as part of our ideal version of ourselves. But, you know, maybe let's focus on the FTP and the kilograms will probably come off in the process or we're going to hit our, our goal weight in the process sort of regardless. Pick one and focus on it. And usually the other, the other stuff's going to start following. Right, right. And I do like that idea of of subtracting because as you can sort of tell from my question I believe you can't just keep adding and actually on that note of addition and subtraction I'm thinking of another article you wrote earlier this year and I've always referred to it as how to marry condo your cycling gear yes oh I love this one <laughs> it's a good one but tell me about saying yes or no to new gear uh, and remember uh, to keep in mind uh, in your answer that we love gear. Oh my gosh, me too. Uh, <laughs> this is definitely not like I, you don't need any new gear ever or you have to get rid of all of your gear. I think my biggest thing with the idea of Marie Condoing your cycling gear is really streamlining the getting out the door process the best way we can. And usually that does not involve a giant drawer of mismatched socks or a, you know, pile of jerseys where half of them have a broken zipper or you know like 90% of them you're not going to wear because you don't like how they fit or the bib shorts that always give you a saddle sore or like gives you the sausage legs. I think we hang on to a lot of this old stuff and it it ends up crowding our gear rooms. It makes it impossible for us to get ready really quickly. And, you know, then then we have our computer. Oh, my gosh, the electronics alone. Right. Like how many times have you left for a ride, but then realized you didn't have your bike light charged and I have to run inside and like give it 10 minutes to charge or you forgot your garments and you're trying to get your smartphone synced up so you can use that instead. And you just take all of this extra time with your gear that could be spent doing that training. So if you take an extra five minutes to get ready, that's an extra two hours a month that you're wasting, which is, you know, 100 hours a or sorry, like 15 hours a year, say, that you could be training instead of just like struggling to find your stuff. So that's the tip on uh, getting rid of all of your crappy old gear that you hate and streamlining how you get ready. But when it comes to new gear, I'm all about it. But I am all about like thinking through every piece of new gear instead of just kind of piling up, you know, the nth bike that's now taking up space in your garage without thinking about saying goodbye to one of the other ones. I know it can be really painful, but think about how much more space you'll have for bike parking if all the bikes you have are the ones that you actually use and you maintain and they all look great. Like, don't we all want to don't we all want to live like that? <laughs> Your work primarily covers fitness, health, technique, and training. But in that work, I see a strong influence from the world of personal productivity. By personal productivity, I'm thinking of such ideas as getting things done, popularized by David Allen. What are the links you see between personal productivity and fitness and training? Oh, my gosh. Okay, so... Real talk. The first two books that I remember reading when I was eight years old are this book called Getting Organized. Uh, I was probably the only third grader that had an inbox and an outbox on her desk at home. And uh, and Cher's Forever Fit. That's right. Cher, like the Cher, wrote a fitness book. And these two books were my absolute favorite books. And for some reason, things of them just have stuck with me for the last, you know, 26 years. Uh, and for some reason, it, they've always just kind of gone together. Uh, it was actually Bernstein Bears, same thing. They had Bernstein Bears in the messy room and Bernstein Bears in too much junk food. I still have both of those books on my bookshelf right now. I can see them. I have always just kind of put the two together. I think. You know, for me, fitness and healthy living and stuff kind of only work when the rest of your life is also feeling pretty productive and streamlined. 
because I mean, it's pretty hard to enjoy a workout if you're out there and you're just kind of so scattered and thinking about a million things and stressed about the fact that like maybe you forgot to send an email, but you don't even know because your inbox has 300 messages in it and you have all these voicemails that you haven't checked on. I'm stressing myself out just listing these things. And healthy eating, I mean, that just goes, you know, in the same line as keeping really productive grocery lists as per the David Allen getting things done, you know, write things down as soon as you think of them so they're out of your head. I have that with like a running grocery list and that's how we manage to keep eating healthy. So I just don't really think you can have one without the other. And I think they all kind of create like a cascade effect. The more productive you are with work, the more time you have to train, the more organized you are with, uh, you know, your shopping and all that, the healthier you eat. So it all just kind of blends together. (laughs) Are there any areas or any situation where the worlds of personal productivity and fitness and training don't necessarily jive? Uh, Yeah, actually, I'd probably say, honestly, endurance sport, right? If you think about the most efficient way to to train, we're going to be talking about high intensity interval training. That's been super trendy these past couple of years, sort of in the personal productivity sphere. But, you know, to me, I'd rather get out and do a six hour gravel adventure ride or, you know, a three hour trail run. And that might not be the most efficient or most productive use of my time, but it's definitely the thing that makes me the happiest. Uh, So I think in that way, they they definitely differ. Like I could keep producing work forever, but I'm not going to get to actually enjoy spending those that time on the bike. At the start of your book, Becoming a Consummate Athlete, you and Peter come out swinging. You tell readers they are athletes. Why is it important for the reader of your book to consider themselves an athlete? This is one of my like favorite things. And it was something that was really tough for me because I wasn't an athlete as a kid at all. So I think, you know, Peter has an easier time with this because he grew up playing sports. He started racing when he was, you know, 15, 16. So he's always been sort of in this category of an athlete. Um, but to me, developing the identity as an athlete is so important because say we only have 10 hours a week to train typically, right? Or seven to 10 for sort of your average person who works a normal nine to five. That's not that many hours, but we have all of these other hours in the day where we can be doing things that help us be healthier, happier, better athletic versions of ourselves. So if we can see ourselves as athletes, all of those other hours, not just the time that we're on the bike, I think it makes it easier to make healthy choices throughout the day and not just healthy in terms of like raising our FTP, but healthy in terms of, you know, improving longevity, increasing our, you know, mobility so we don't have you know, as much struggle with injury and recovery and stuff like that. Um, So I think if you think of yourself as an athlete, you're going to wake up and you're going to, you know, want to do a few sun salutations and maybe drink a glass of water before you have your second cup of coffee. You know, you're going to be okay with ordering the salad at lunch instead of the cheeseburger or maybe the salad with the cheeseburger. You know, that's fine too. (laughs) You're going to go to bed a little bit earlier because you're going to know you're an athlete and you have a training ride tomorrow morning. So I think if you can think of yourself as an athlete, it makes it a lot easier to make the choices that are going to be healthier for us all around. In contrast to that um, person who identifies as an athlete, and this is a type that came up in your book, you mentioned the person who buys gear, uh, goes out, rides hard, doesn't fuel properly or even sleep properly or recover enough. Why is that a common behavior. And I would also say this person maybe doesn't self-identify as an athlete, but is really keen on, you know, the pursuit of fitness and riding bikes. And and, and yet there is there is this disconnect with all these other components. That's most of us on January 1st uh, in past years, or at least all of us can remember a time where we've done that in our lives. Um, you know, we get busy with other things and then we, we realize suddenly that we're a little more out of shape than we'd want to be or you know we don't feel as good as we want to be so we we go hard for you know two or three days and then we end up probably injured probably you know stressed out probably really sore uh, and we put it away for you know a few months and then kind of fall back into that exact same cycle um i've seen that you know really often i'd say personally i i've seen it in the past 10 years with my younger sister and just this past uh this past pandemic she finally i guess because 
of the pandemic and because, you know, there weren't restaurants or anything to go out to, or, you know, she couldn't do sort of her normal life stuff. The gyms were closed and everything. So she couldn't go into her, you know, once a month, go to the gym, take five classes, do strength, and then go home and be sore for a week and then give up for three weeks, come back. She actually started going out and walking and adding a little bit of running. She's honestly fitter than she's been in her entire life and feeling great and looking great. And it's because she was finally able to do the consistency of doing something, just a little bit of something every day instead of saving it all up and doing, you know, the one thing a month. That's a theme that has definitely come up in your writing and Peter's writing, the focus on consistency and Doing something, you know, reasonable, not going out and hammering, I don't know, 100 clicks if you've never done 100 clicks, but starting slow and and just doing smaller steps, but consistently. And I think actually this brings us back to your intentions because they give you maybe the permission to think a little smaller in a good way and then come back to things over and over again. Exactly. Yeah. Like we don't we don't need to think about stressing about meeting this exact goal and oh my gosh, we need to have this many training hours or all is lost. You know, instead we can be thinking, how am I gonna feel my best as a cyclist? How am I gonna feel my best as an athlete? You know, what's what's going to make me the happiest this week or this month or this year? So I think if we can just kind of keep coming back to that, we're gonna be in a much better place come 2022 instead of, uh, you know, kind of a a bummed out place because we didn't get to do any of our, any of the smart goals that we we set forward. So I'm all about intentions this year. Let's explore those a little bit more. Help me turn some of these statements into productive intentions or how do we, we let these intentions guide us? What are some possible things we can do with them? So Here's a classic New Year's resolution. I want to lose weight. Ooh. So I would really try to shift the gears on this to wanting to eat healthier would probably be like the the best way I would do that. And I would say, you know, I'd be setting the intention of I want to eat more vegetables with, you know, every day in every meal. I want to drink more water instead of drinking more alcohol would probably be a really, really smart one this year. Um, Really just thinking about intending to make healthier choices that are going to feel better for your body because, you know, weight loss, I guess the important thing there is asking yourself, am I trying to lose weight to look a certain way? Am I trying to lose weight to feel a certain way? So if we can say feel a certain way, we can say, okay, what are the things that we're doing right now that aren't making us feel good versus things that we know are going to make us feel better, like eating our vegetables, getting that fiber and micronutrients and drinking enough water and feeling hydrated. So, yeah, I'd be thinking about what's going to make me feel better in my body, not just what's the number on the scale going to say. Okay, next one. I want to ride more. See, that actually is a good intention. I would probably be looking at where I was at last year, you know, how many hours, and then looking at my schedule now and thinking, okay, are there spaces in here for me to ride more? Are there things I can get rid of in order to make more room for riding more? That's an intention in and of itself, but we do need to do a little bit of work to make them, you know, things we can actually do. So taking a bit of time to just start thinking about if there are any any parts of our life where we can, you know, subtract things so we have more more space for riding. And I mean, I'm going to come back to feeling again. Sorry, but why do you want to ride more? Do you want to ride more because it feels good when you ride? Or do you want to ride more because you, you know, want to match training hours that your your partner is doing or that your friends group is doing? Like, is this actually an intention that's going to make you feel good at the end of the year? Or is this just kind of this arbitrary thing that you're just kind of randomly saying because every year you say it and every year you try to make it true? I like that one. Or I like the advice in there because you're asking, well, why do you want to do this? And if you have this intention, but, you know, where is it coming from? If it's not coming from an honest place, then you, there's no way. And you've sort of touched on this already. You've There's no way you're going to accomplish that if you don't honestly want it. Exactly. Similar to ride more, what about things like uh, riding faster or farther for that matter? Again, I'm going to say first, I want you to come back to the feeling like, why do you actually want to do that? And how is that going to make you feel? And you can't just answer faster. That that does not count. Is there a reason you actually want to? 
Uh, and then, I mean, looking at what you've been doing and can you stay on the same track? I mean, I think a lot of us would set some a set a goal like that or set an intention like that. And actually what that means is just sticking to what we've been doing, sticking to what works, just keeping that consistency rolling and maybe actually avoiding the January freak out of doing that billion hour week or billion hour couple days where we get stressed out and go overboard and have to take a month off. So maybe it's actually about kind of coming back to this consistency or, you know, we could set the intention as far as the farther goes of going on some, you know, a few fun exploratory trips that are in our own backyard this summer. You know, we're probably not going to get to bike pack over in Europe. We can say that. That's probably not one that I would put on my goal list for 2021. Yeah. But can we do something just in our local neighborhood? We've talked to people who've actually done some really cool bike packing things where they literally just come back to their backyard at night and they're just doing like loops around their neighborhood, but they're kind of getting used to the idea of bike packing that way. I love that as an idea. And I would, you know, make the intention and put some stuff on the calendar. It's not like it's not like we're saying that you can't have any kind of set uh, set dates or exact plans. We're just saying start by leading with feeling versus leading with some numbers. It's true. And, and just as I'm listening to you work with these ideas, you do sneak in some specificity, like lose weight is, is a pretty big, big goal. But then when you turn it to vegetables and, and knocking off uh, alcoholic beverages, subtracting those things, then You've you've snuck in specifics from, you know, the old smart thing. This helps it work and it helps this intention work. It gives some it gives you a way forward with it. Exactly. I think we we need to think of this as like intentions with this whole idea of feelings and this kind of softer look and everything. But remembering that our intentions are supposed to get us somewhere. It's not like we're we're just gonna set these things that we are just going to forget about January 2nd. No, we we actually do want these to turn into us being better versions of ourselves for next year. And you know what? That's going to take some specifics. It's going to take some work. It's not like magically me just saying that I have these intentions is going to create results. But we just need to be, you know, a little bit gentler with ourselves. It's the it's the the safer fabrics version of getting fitter and faster and Molly, I really appreciate this conversation. It's always uh, great to talk to you. There's always great ideas and great advice. It's helped me with my productivity, getting out the door on my rides. So thank you, Molly. Oh, thank you so much. This is super fun. And that's the episode. It's written and edited by me, Matthew Piaro. I had help from web editors Terry McCall and Lily Hanson-Gillis. The podcast is produced by Adam Killick. He composed the music too. Thanks to Ontario Creates for its support. And thank you for listening. A special shout out goes to young Evan Zikovitz, who I've heard digs the show. Well, Evan, I appreciate you lending me your ears throughout this past year. To everyone... Please tune back in later in January when we return from our winter break. In the meantime, ride safely, whether that's indoors or out, and I'll talk to you later.